Tomorrow's Independence Day, on the 4th, and this is Independence Weekend. No doubt many people will be on the lake getting naked, partying, and getting drunk. Probably a lot of accidents, fatalities. Because of that, life goes on on planet Earth. Amen? Amen. But there is a culture that used to be the major culture in this country. It still believes in the Bible, still believes in the Bible ways, and uh, we're just going to hang in there, amen, till the Lord comes and gets us out of here. And we'd rather serve God than mammon, we'd rather understand the truths of the Bible than all the wisdom this world's got to offer. In 1 Peter chapter 3.15, I want to preach a message on giving a reason, giving a reason. And uh, where our country's going, there seems like most of the people don't even have a reason for anything, except their little emotions. And uh, over here in First Peter, chapter three and uh, verse fifteen. The Bible says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, so God's telling you to do it, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you, that's individual, correct, a reason of the hope that is where, on you, outside of you, in you, see it, the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Father, we love you. We thank you for your mercy and your grace on us. And Father, dear God, for our country. And, and God, we know uh, as we look across the, almost a century now of just seems like it's blaspheming everything you stand for, dear God, last hundred years and different ways and avenues as Christians allow this to take place in uh, their own country for whatever reason. And God, I pray that you just be merciful to us. Father, we we agree on what we deserve, and Father, uh, uh, what you ask us to do, we'll, we'll humbly do. Father, dear God, we just pray for mercy, uh, dear God, for our country. And, and Father, we pray for the believer that is uh, in our presence now, Father, dear God, that uh, they would take note of some things, Father, they would uh, recognize some things, they'd even maybe be stirred up and, and to uh, uh, research some things, Father, and and God, we just love you today, and we pray that you'd fill us with thy spirit. We pray those that are saved would have that simple prayer of asking you to fill them and as hearers, dear God, and that you'd be edified, and you'd get all the glory for whatever happens today. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, the Bible's talking about giving a reason that's humbling. Uh, it's a humbling beginning if you think about yourself. Uh, that's how you started with Christ. You didn't start with Christ as being puffed up, that's for sure. You wouldn't get nowhere with God if you were puffed up with your pride. Uh, he hates that. Um, he, he won't even come to the door if you knock. I mean, if you're full of that pride, it's just something about the Bible and that pride and about the devil. Uh, that, that, uh, that spirit, that character trait uh, comes from. And, and I remember being a sinner, and you should too. I remember being wretched and unworthy of heaven, and you should too if you're a Christian here. You had a humbling beginning. And then number two, the love of God, His mercy, and His grace uh, came about you, and, and you experienced that, and, and your testimony is your hope. That is your testimony. Because Christ is in you, the hope of glory. You have a testimony now because Jesus Christ saved your wretched soul. And uh, your testimony is your hope, and you're supposed to tell others about it. I understand that according to the scriptures. Uh, go to James chapter 1. So James chapter 1, just go to the left a little bit uh, in your Bible. James chapter 1. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's just uh, an honor to still be able to stand in a pulpit and, and, uh, pulpit and uh, do this, uh, what I'm doing here today. And it ought to be an honor to you that you can sit there and listen. Uh, with nobody kicking in the door yet and, and arresting your pastor and uh, threatening you. And uh, even though it seems like uh, that type of culture is knocking on our door. In James 1 and verse 25, it says this, 
But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty. Isn't that amazing? Some people think that the law and liberty don't go together. But there is a law of liberty. And isn't it good that the Lord, when he saved you, purged you from dead works so you can now serve a living God? Uh, that means you've got no barriers. Uh, that means you can come boldly before the throne of grace and obtain mercy in the time of need. You don't have to carry no uh, uh, oxen, lamb, sheep, uh, turtle doves. You don't have to do any of that stuff. You can go directly to God. Well, that's a blessing. Amen. That is a blessing when you think about it. The power that you have with your heavenly Father because you are in the family of God. That's why you can say, Abba, Father. Who do you say that with? The spirit that's inside of you is crying, Abba, Father. Isn't that amazing? We could develop that too. Because what a blessing it is a long time ago when something ever happened to me, I'd immediately go to the phone and I'd call somebody up, uh, try to get a neighbor, try to do this, this. But now the first thing that comes to my mind is to cry out to God. Isn't that amazing? I mean, just God help me. God lead me. Give me some wisdom. Who should I call, Lord? And as I'm talking to people, I'm talking to God. I need wisdom. I need help. I need patience. Where's that coming from? I'm a father. I'm saved. The Holy Ghost of God is sealed in me. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. These are some of the evidences of your salvation. Your dependence now is on your Heavenly Father. You just changed daddies. You went from the devil to God. I think that's a blessing. And you ought to too. So knowing God's liberty and doing His will is an important thing for a Christian. I mean, you have liberty from religious trappings uh, to, free, uh, to free yourself. Uh, to a self-governing uh, existence. What do you mean? It means that you have the power over yourself to keep yourself in line. That's self-government. And you know what's right and what's wrong. And you do right by the grace of God. And you are zealous of good works by the grace of God. These are things that you control. Uh, this is why we don't like big government. Uh, this is why we don't want people telling us what to do, because we feel we're capable and responsible to do those things. And we have this liberty built in us. And even children that were raised in this country, even if they didn't know the Lord Jesus Christ, they still have that in them to be independent. Now that could be a wrong thing too, but that's Americans. It came from somewhere. It came from our forefathers. And it came from God, the originator of liberty. Got to have God to have true liberty. You still with me? Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, proclaiming liberty because it's, because it's the truth is a requirement of this sonship that we have. In James 2, once again in James chapter 2, and in verse uh, uh, 12, the Bible says this. So speak ye, and so do as they that shall be judged of the law of liberty. In other words, there's going to be an accountability sometime in our future, and a lot of times in this very life, that uh, we're going to have to get into, give an account for the things we've done in this flesh as a Christian. I'm not talking about sin. That was covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm talking about those doing things, that you either did it for God or you did it for yourself. You're either self-serving or you're serving God. Those are the things. Those are of what sort it is, the Bible says. Your motive uh, apparende. Why did you do the things that you did? That's what you're going to be judged by. And, 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 and it's an amazing thing that uh, a lot of people don't like that uh, too much, that uh, accountability. But also, back in verse 25 of James 1, I want you to see what's emphasized in that also is. It says, but whoso uh, looketh into the perfect law of liberty, now look what it says, and continueth therein. Now, now, whenever you look at that, make sure that you understand that we're not Calvinistic to think that God's going to do everything for us. Everything is Bible, all of a sudden he puts a responsibility on you. Now, that's the difference between a religious person and a Christian person. Uh, you cannot live the Christian life without being a Christian. You can claim to be a Christian, but there's no way you've got the power of God to fulfill that obligation. The whole purpose of Christ coming down here to save us was to work through us because we're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Amen. 
or his workmanship. We're co-laborers with Christ. What does that mean? That means if you don't have him, you can't work for him. You're working for yourself. You do a lot of good deeds, but you're working for yourself. And that's dangerous. So, but whosoever looketh in the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So not only a forgetful, he can't be a forgetful hearer, but he has to be a doer of the work. Remember that. It's, some, it's, it's good stuff. Now proclaiming liberty once again. It's the truth. It's a requirement for us. Truth in our lives, our homes, our communities, and our blessed nation. Vernon Hall, and I'll go to this lady, this dear lady. I have all her books in, in, in my office. I got them years ago. Uh, there's a lot of uh, different things that uh, they overemphasize at times, like the providence of God, which lends itself to a little Calvinistic theology. But uh, I can understand that because any Bible believer that's afraid of the word providence uh, doesn't know his Bible. Apparently he lost something somewhere. Providence of God means God still deals in the affairs of men. He controls history. The word history means his story. And you have to get a hold of that thing in the right perspective. Does he make you do things? Are you a robot? No, we're just, we already read scripture that says you've got to do something. How do you get saved? You've got to cry out to God, call on the, call on the Lord, and uh, so on and so forth. So the providence of God is very important for you to understand, too, that we just didn't, this ain't happenstance that America came here. Now, I, she has an article here, and I'm going to read it, and you're going to listen uh, because it's been a long time probably that you listened to anything unless you were here a couple weeks ago. The law of liberty had a threefold relation to the founding of America. Its colonization, the war for independence, and the formation of the American Christian Constitution. The law of liberty has an equally important relation to the restoring and maintaining of our Christian civil government. To consider Americans... Uh, Christian history means to thoroughly ponder what the nation, America, is in the Christian era, to attentively weigh America's unique and excellent form of government, to think what an American Christian's responsibility might be to maintain the original intent of our Constitution. It is by diligently pondering the cause of America's history that the American Christian begins to understand the goodness of God in bringing the nation of America, America into being uh, for his gospel purpose. To consider America's Christian history means to behold the hand of God in all events leading to the Declaration of Independence and the Constitutional Convention. It is more than a passing glance at our country or an occasional patriotic thought. America's Christian history should be as a seal upon thine heart, Song of Solomon 8.6 says, because it pertains to Christ his story of civil freedom, civil government, in the Christian era. Consider the many unusual aspects in the setting of America's 13 colonies, the enduring and winning of the seven-year war for independence and the established, uh, establishing of the first Christian constitution the world has ever known. All these human events required a peculiar people zealous of good works, according to Titus 2.14 and 1 Peter 2.9. Ponder the fact that for 150 years, God gathered and allowed, now listen to this, representatives from all parts of Europe and Africa to come to America until 1775. There were almost 3 million people settled upon the eastern seaboard. Such a diversity of races, colors, and creeds had not been able to live peaceably with one another in their respected homelands. Yet in America, they were able to unite voluntarily and without a strong central government, defeat England, the greatest military power of the time. They were able to make the transition with surprisingly little difficulty from colonies dependent on England politically, economically, and culturally, and to a considerable degree religiously, to independent states. They were able to move in an orderly manner from a confederation to a federation, the world's first Christian republic. 
They established their national federal constitution upon the biblical principles by which they had lived for over 150 years, that is, God's principle of individuality, Christian self-government, property, and voluntary union. How did all these events happen? And why did they happen in America when they did? Was it solely man's intellectual uh, capability which initiated and carried through these accomplishments? Or was it the providence of God working for and through his people for his purpose and according to his timetable of events? The Christian history of American revolution is not to be proved through the contemporary Christian statements of individuals or sermons of the clergy. Although there are such statements and sermons, not through public uh, documents referring to God as the governor of the world, although there are such documents, not even through providential events, although there are such events. These are effects, the results of God's law of liberty being accepted and obeyed individually and internationally. And as much as Christian liberty is individual, internal, and uh, causative, does it not follow that there should be a societal, external effect of this fact? In other words, if you're a Christian, it should show. The phrase, American Christian History, and the title, The Christian History of the American Revolution, is based upon the conviction that America's civil freedom, that is freedom for the individual, came from God through His Son, Jesus Christ, and is the result or effect of Christianity's development and westward march from Asia through Europe and England to America. The cause and timing of events which led to the war for American independence, the rising up of civil and military leaders, and the willingness of a diversified people to be self-governed. The cause of these aspects and many more is attributed to the fulfillment of the promises of God to those who obey his precepts in his word, obey his law of liberty, in all aspects of their lives, including civil government. I talked to somebody that went to Washington, and um, I said, did you go to the Jefferson? Did you go to all the memorials? Did you did you read the, the wisdom on the walls? And, and uh, uh, his eyes started watering up. He said, man, I was so blessed for going there. I never thought. See, the kids taught in school today are not taught right. Haven't been. If they have their way, they're going to tear everything down that has anything to do with God. They're working diligently to do that. And they have a program. And I know you came here and you want to be a little encouraged, and I'm trying to encourage you. But man, for us uh, to forget our roots, that's no good. That is no good. Um, I mean, I, 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 I read this little article here, and... Um, and uh, I think about uh, I think about my own commitment, and you need to think about yours. To who? To God, family, and country. You have a commitment. Uh, I hear the brethren, super spiritual brethren, all say, "Well, we're from a we're from another country, preacher." I know that. Matter of fact, I'm a citizen of another country. That's why I'm an ambassador here. But America is unique. It is not like me being called to the mission field of another country under their rules and regulations, and serving over there. I cannot defend certain things over there. Here, knowing my roots, knowing the blood that was shed, knowing that God was in the foundation and formation, I should be committed to death to support some of these views that are biblical. Now you cannot, now, now think about this, and I'm not, this is not, uh, it probably is derogatory, it probably is mean-spirited, so we just get that over, I'll put it in parentheses, okay? Listen, you cannot make it to Sunday school, nor all services at the local assembly, because of legitimate reasons, sicknesses, medication, debilitating physical conditions, all understood by God, all understood. What if we went by your home during church time? Would you be there? How about leaving early in the morning for doctor's appointments or vacation or visiting friends and family? You see, when you think about this country and where it's going in the, in the local church, 
It's an amazing thing. It rises and falls on commitment. Commitment is faithfulness. Faithfulness is responsibility to a cause, to a belief worthy of dying for. I think about what is your hope? Why claim Christ and not be doers of the word? Why claim America and not vote, speak out against its heirs, write Congress, senators, and stay vigilant? Why not do that? Bible-believing Baptist churches are losing their influence because of heartless Christians, because of ignorant Christians of Bible doctrine, of Baptist history. Christian America has lost its influence because of losing its Bible, because of its ignorance of its history. We have failed to pass it on. We have lost the will to give a reason of the hope that lies within. I mean, I mean, what your heart is in, that will you give. I'm telling you, you'll give your life to it, your time, your energy, and your money. Whatever you're into, that's what you're going to do. The money we spend on videos and games and the time we expand on all these things to loss of sleep, most Americans are amused. They don't muse the Bible. They are amused. How do you know that? Because I'm one of them Americans every night. I count the hours. I try to structure it so I have most of my day. But I'm telling you what, the more I think about it, the more you lose it. When you're, I'm telling you, amusement. You got to look up the word. Anti-musing. You know what enthusiastic is? We use it for sports and everything, but you know what it means? In God. If you go back to the original intent. Original. <laughs> if you go back to the structure of language. In theos. I mean, you know, you study that stuff, you're saying, wow, that's sort of weird. That's sort of cool. I mean, American Idol, we could preach on that all day long, right? But most of us watch it, we think, oh, that's cool, they're good. Look at all the talent there. What'd they name it? What did they name it? In our faces, desensitized Christians, they can put it right in your face. And we enjoy it. We laugh at the jokes. We do all. We come a long way, baby. Because there's no fear of what's happening here. Given a reason. I mean, when you come to church, shouldn't you be provoked to do something right? I mean, that's what it's about, isn't it? Provoke on the good works. Uh, didn't Peter say, let me put your remembrance of these things, meaning that you should know, but over and over again, we're human. God set this thing up. You got preachers, you got evangelists, you got teachers trying to edify you, perfect you, trying to get you stirred up to remember some things. But if you don't get a hold of that, man, it's like, it's like taking your whole life and putting it in the garbage can. You got no purpose. You got no soul in it. Somebody robbed you of that commitment. It could have been a bad church experience. It could have been a bad pastor. It could have been all these things. But, but what is the commitment? The commitment is to the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Not to anybody else. Right. So you haven't, you haven't even fell, fallen in love with your Savior yet. Because you serve Him. You're committed to Him. When you die, you will see Him. You're to please Him. Given a reason. Given a reason. John Quincy Adams, boy, he says, Why is it that next to the birthday of the Savior, we know the world celebrates Christmas, he says, next to the birthday of the Savior of the world, your most joyous and most venerated festival returns on this day, the 4th of July. It should be here today. All sorts of festivals. <laughs> he says, Is it not that in the chain of human events the birthday of the nation is indissolubly linked with the birthday of the Savior? That it forms a leading event in the progress of the gospel dispensation? Is it not that the Declaration of Independence first organized the social compact? on the foundation of the Redeemer's mission upon earth, that it laid the cornerstone of human government upon the first precepts of Christianity. For all those listening that don't think God was in our 
foundation or in our forefathers. You've never read the quote, so. For those that think the Constitution is just a flippant piece of paper and, and it's ever-changing as, as the culture changes, you've never read the uh, Federalist Papers. you never read the arguments, pros and cons, so that they could come to this conclusion. You see, and even if you did, you wouldn't understand it. Do you know why? You have no fear of God. No fear of God at all. Matter of fact, you don't even believe in a creator. That's why you can't comprehend the Constitution. That's why you cannot even comprehend the moral structure of this country. Because it's been taught out of you. See, in your heart of hearts, you know there's a creator. In your heart of hearts, when you look in a mirror, you never think you're going to die. You can, you can talk boldly to people, oh yeah, one day and then we'll just die. But you never really considered death. You never did. Because something inside of you tells you you're going to live forever. And this preacher says you're right. Something inside of you is going to live forever. And it's either going to go to hell forever, or it's going to go to blessed glory forever. That's the choice is up to you. But you've been taught out of that stuff with, with evolution and all these kinds of airhead things. And that's why the country's going down. But you think it's going up. You have people in Congress and the Senate now that think this is the greatest thing since sliced pie or sliced bread. What, what's happened to them? They're blind. They know not God. And they can't even see what's going on. Period. Because they have a cause. And the spirit of this world is dictating things to them, and they're receiving it. Because their father is not our father. Jesus Christ told them, ye are of your father the devil. That's why they can't receive the words of God. But yet people keep putting hopes in people. No, you better put hope and prayer in God. This Campsville Presbyterian Church in Virginia Beach, uh, 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 Virginia, a Reverend Nate Atwood, he's a Presbyterian. There's been a lot of Presbyterians throughout the uh, ages that stuck up for our constitutional rights. We're on the platform of our Constitution. But see, the more you know Baptist history, the more, the more you know those Baptists that were in the Revolutionary War, if it was a Congregationalist, if it was a Methodist, if it was a Presbyterian, guess, guess what usually took place? I won't say... I can't say absolutely with the Methodists, but with those others, if they were captured uh, by, by British troops, uh, normally they were put into prison and stocks and, and did they? You know what they did? The Baptists? They killed them. Something about them Baptists just infuriated them Brits. Well, they knew how to die. I know that. And they knew how to fight. And they weren't afraid to speak the truth. But see, they weren't affiliated. They weren't affiliated with the religious organizations that come out of uh, Europe in the sense of protesting Catholicism. They weren't affiliated with that church. But all those that marched against us were. So you see, we do got a heritage. And the first ones that they're going to get down in this country, they've already been working on. The big B. A, P, T, I, S, T. Everything on television. They don't just say a specific preacher went wrong or, or this. They blame his congregation. They blame the entire Baptist faith. And they get it out of the people. And, and next thing you know, people think Baptists eat people. And they're just perverts. And they're just this and that. Because the news media, why don't they pick on the Pope? Why don't they pick on the Catholic Church? They did. Remember all those, uh, remember all those priests? Yeah, yeah. It sort of went out of the news now, right? And all the newscasters, uh, around Christmas, midnight mass, listen to them. Drooling over them. The Holy Father. My Bible says call no man father. All capitals mean the Holy Father. Right. Your heritage is important, people. You need to know it. Anyway, this fellow uh, wrote a sermon and, and uh, back in probably 2006 or whatever. I gleaned some things from it. Uh, going into it, he says, Americans have wandered out of history. We are overwhelmed by the instant moment headlined in this morning's newspaper and flashed on this hour's telecast. As a result, we can't see the whole real world around us. We don't see the actual conditions of our long-lived body national. In a word, we have lost our sense of history. 
In our schools, the story of our nation has been replaced by social studies, which is the story of what ails us. Neither our classroom lessons, nor our sermons, nor our books are any longer strong ties of our past. This preacher didn't say it, but Dr. Daniel uh, Borstein, which is a, uh, he's a, a reputable, uh, a respected historian, in 1970 said that. Well, we come a long way since then. It is reported that Adolf Hitler, we have a paper called The Citizen, and there's an organization I don't agree with, but because of our freedom of speech, you've got to let them, just like they have to let us, and, and Baptists got that into the kind of, you know, it's just one of those things, if you know your Baptist history. Uh, we were influential in getting that in, or that that uh, uh, Constitutional Congress would have never pass and got a Constitution if it wasn't for uh, John Leland and the people of Virginia uh, that uh, got the Baptist Church together and told them this has got to be in there. That's why you and I have this freedom now, this freedom of religion, you see. It's because of Baptist, and you won't see that on TV or Nova. You just got to look up names and figure out, oh, what church? They go, oh, well, I didn't mention that name. Interesting to history. But uh, in the newspaper, uh, I saw that uh, uh, they were saying they were painting our president as a, as a, uh, a type of Nazism, you know, and stuff like this, you know. And, uh, and people got upset over that because, I mean, he does have an office. He is the president of the United States, right? Romans 13, we're to pray for him, right? Let me show you something here. It is reported that Adolf Hitler once said, that he who controls the writing of a nation's history controls the nation. Thus Hitler revised German history and deliberately changed the original principles of Germany to, to a set of principles that per, uh, permitted him to embark on a course of world domination. Controlling German education for roughly 10 years, he raised a new generation of Hitler youth who were pro propagandized by Hitler's historical revisionism. It wasn't Lutheran Germany that uh, produced the genocide and pursued satanic policies. It was a new Germany built on Hitler's historical revisionism and theology of the Third Reich. Lenin and Stalin did the same for Russia. See, they get mad at people that do some investigation in history and see all the correlations, see all the connection here, and wonder, what's going on? Are they that stupid or are they working a plan? Is evil working its plan? Why well, go to Scripture and see that he has? I can see there's been a conspiracy ever since the garden to destroy us. I can see that. You'd be a fool not to see that working together. But out of all the people in the world, we should have eyes to see, ears to hear. We, and if you know that, why aren't you saying nothing? There used to be an expression. You know what that was? Has the cat got your tongue? You ever look up that expression? Has the cat got your tongue? Keep saying something bad about the Catholic Church in the dark ages. See if you have a tongue anymore. Preacher, you're in a, you should be, I love all religions. You know, this is what I, this, this, Jesus said he's the truth. He said he's the ways of life. He says he's the only mediator between God and man. So, and, and, and it says, by grace are you saved. Through faith, it's not a works, it's not of yourself. So if anybody promotes works, if anybody claims to be the vicar of Christ, God Almighty on earth, <laughs> I'm not supposed to stay quiet. No, you're nuts. You're a wuss. you got no commitment to your own faith. You haven't read your Bible. You don't even know how Peter or Paul preached. They're damnable heresies. Sending people to hell, the traditions of men. Right. That's why this country's going down. You don't even say anything about them church ruining the country. Right. You're politically correct because you watch so much TV. You start loving what they love. Your vocabulary has changed. Your heart's changed. Americans have wandered out of history. We know far uh, more about the Washington Redskins than we do General Washington. We know more about Elizabeth Smart than we do John and Abigail Adams. We live in the present, and oftentimes we live in the trivial. Uh, let's do something biblical. Uh, let's remember our history, and let's remember the part God had to play in it. 
as the Jews. Remember them Jews? They were mindful and they were careful to tell the story of their nation and God's acts in that story. Now let's not only tell the children the story of the Bible, let's tell our children the story of America. And let's do it for uh, not for selfish purposes of American pride or because we want to protect our standard of living. Uh, let's do it because we love truth. Uh, let's do it because the original vision of America was to build a country on the enduring values of Scripture so that she would be a testimony to the world that Scripture works. Notice I'm saying Scripture works. Uh, let's do it because there's a profound connection between human freedom and human dignity both of which matter to God. Let's do it to preserve this nation for our children and grandchildren. And let's do it because a free nation provides the best environment in which to spread our faith in Christ, both among our fellow citizens and throughout the world. Now let's talk about the Declaration of Independence and the role Scripture had to play in its writing. Indeed, if we Americans have wandered out of history, let's wander back into it. Got to do it. Speaking as a Christian teacher of Bible, uh, uh, a person, an American citizen, uh, I like to make these basic observations with regard to the Declaration of Independence. Uh, this isn't, first of all, a political document. People miss it. That's why I never tell you to read the Declaration. They push constitution, constitution. You ought to read what came first. Read what came. Read the Declaration of Independence. What's wrong with you people? There's a reason they don't mention that. Man, it's almost as, as hidden as Obama's real birth certificate. I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm telling you when I'm reading this, I, I, I get infuriated sometimes. I can almost get irate. But I'm, I'm asking God to do a work in all of our lives to make us more uh, accountable to him in, in the time and the generation that we're in. The Declaration of Independence is a religious document. Now, if we were to ask you a series of questions, I wonder, wonder if we'd be able to answer these. Well, why did the signers of the de Declaration think uh, they could declare independence? Number one, you know what you think about. Why did the signers of the Declaration think that it was morally permissible to rebel against England? Well, why did the signers of the Declaration think they, as an upstart, ragtag, largely impoverished group of people, could defeat the greatest military power on the face of the earth? Uh, after all, wasn't there... Uh, setting a bit like the Taliban? You say, Taliban? Yeah. Thinking they could defeat the United States? It's what you believe in. It's what you're committed to. They never stopped and thought how big America was. They declare war against us. And, and, and you know how we know they're committed? They kill their own selves, their families. They do everything. They're committed. Do I think it's right for them to do that? No. I mean, they're fighting against me. We're trying to help them, right? And we get even more to the point. What was their authority for making these claims, the revolutionaries, and choosing this course of action? Where did they think human rights came from? How do they understand the role of government in human affairs? Well, the answer, of course, is con contained in the Declaration itself. It says we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men, all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. What are they instituted for? For our rights. We're not created for their rights. Remember, I think it was George Washington didn't want to be a king. Remember that? Way back? Yeah. You need to understand that. So as you read the Declaration of Independence, it is very clear that the moral authority for the drive for independence was found in God himself. Even more to the point, this moral authority was found in the Bible itself. John Adams, in a letter written late in his life to Thomas Jefferson, remarked that the founding fathers found their agreement in the basic principles of Christianity. This is a remarkable statement. And scrutiny of the Declaration itself suggests just this. Let's take a moment and step inside the Declaration and connect the dots between the various phrases and thoughts found therein and the teaching of the Bible. In fact, let's begin with the idea of rights. Where did the concept of rights come from? Well, it is taught in the Bible. It really is. And for an example, in, in, in Psalms 82, 1 through 4, it re refers to this concept of rights. It says, 
that God presides in the great assembly. He gives judgment among the gods. How long will you defend the unjust and show partiality to the wicked, Selah? Defend the cause of the weak and fatherless. Maintain the rights of the poor and oppressed. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Now what we must grasp is the Founding Fathers lived in an era profoundly shaped by the Bible. As, as inheritors of the Reformation, they lived in a time when it was simply taken for granted that society was to be structured around the teaching of the Bible. And never forget everything I'm saying today is all wrapped up in what? The Bible. Not my emotions, religious designations, or people. It's wrapped up in the scriptures. You and I have that inspired, preserved book right there, that King James Bible. Wherever you go, you can take that thing with you. Thing, not blasphemous, said, uh, but that object. And with God's Holy Spirit in you, in that supernatural book, you can move mountains. You can climb out of addiction. You can understand why the love of Christ should constrain you. John Adams, in a letter written late in his life to Thomas Jefferson, remarked that the Founding Fathers found their agreement in the basic principles of Christianity. I know that. Do you know that? That's an amazing thing to think about. <clears throat> think about all those verses in the Bible that have to do with self-government. Additional thoughts and phrases in the Declaration of Independence are clearly biblical. For example, there is a clear definition of the role of government contained in the Declaration. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. That's what the Declaration said. Did you know that this is precisely what the Bible teaches as the role of government? <clears throat> Psalms 82 is written to an assembly of governmental leaders. These are the gods referred to in the Psalm. Romans 13 similarly sees that the government's use of force is based upon a commitment to protect the innocent. You know, the ones doing the crime don't have to worry about the story. You read Romans 13 uh, and, and make sure you got the context right. Uh, so many people don't. Uh, they think we're supposed to be like lambs to the slaughter in certain cases, and, and that's wrong. The Founding Fathers justified their rebellion against the British Crown because it was a government that no longer upheld the rights of the citizens. Their logic was that the British were in rebellion against God by this failure and thus were no longer a legitimate authority. Four times the Declaration of Independence directly refers to God. Each of these references is completely consistent with what the Bible teaches to be true about God and is in fact the same language the Bible used to describe God. The first reference is to the nature. Nature is God. The concept therein is that the idea of justice and law can clearly be deduced <clears throat> from the natural order created by God. This is precisely what the Bible teaches in Romans 1. The second reference is to God as creator. The Bible teaches this in Genesis 1. I realize it may seem obvious to us that God is creator, but if you study world religions and philosophies, you'll learn that this is a distinctly biblical thought. For example, Eastern religions and even Greek thought viewed the universe as eternally pre-existent, at least in the form of matter, if not structure. The idea of a creator is not so universally held, as you may surmise. <clears throat> the last two references to God are found towards the end of the Declaration of Independence. He is referred to as the supreme judge of the world. Yes, again, and again, the Bible teaches us that God is our judge. There is one who seeks and judges, John 8, 50. The final reference to God is an appeal to the protection of divine providence. Here is a profoundly biblical concept. The idea that God is active in the affairs of men, that God rules in those affairs, that God orders those affairs so as to ultimately protect his interests, and that in so doing, he protects those who ally themselves with his causes. The name of the Lord is a strong tower, the righteous run into it and are glad, Proverbs 18.10. And Romans 8.28, we know that one, for we know that in all things God works uh, for, for, for good to those that love him and, and are called according to his purpose. Now let's... Let's, let's think about this Declaration of Independence. Do you see why you have to hold the position of a Christian worldview? You have to hold the position of that Constitution being upheld and understood 
through people that believe in the Creator. You have to, if, unless you want to change. And if you want to change, why? What's your argument? Because the culture is changing. Oh, so you like the direction the culture is going, do you? Hmm. I'm telling you, the Founding Fathers, when you examine the reasons for that course of action that they took, it was clearly about religious reasons. Their appeal was simply to God as their moral authority and their protection. Their actions were political, but their motivations were religious. In other words, before America was conceived in liberty, America was conceived in God. It's hard to believe, isn't it? Do you think God knew at the end times that Israel would be coming under so much fire? Oh, well, who's been protecting Israel all this time? We have. Isn't that amazing? Uh, bad things are coming to our country now in judgments from God. Uh, do you suppose it's because we're trying to get away from helping Israel, the administration? Why don't they connect the dots? Well, who cares if they connect the dots? Are you connecting the dots? The main thing is our Christians connect. Can you see God's working in our nation? Things never happened before are happening. Don't mess with Israel. <laughs> UK has. They're about third-rate country pretty soon. You say, well, they're still got you. You better, you better. You better examine the UK and see where they used to be and where they are now. Because they put hands on God's anointed, his nation. Us as Christians, God chose Israel. We decide to live to all leave all that religious persecution over in Europe and to come to this land to be led by the Spirit and the Book. We chose God. That's how we started. I'll tell you. So on the 4th of July, our national birthday, we should honor our ultimate founding father. Who's that? Our father in heaven. Now some of you are thinking, but Thomas Jefferson was a deist, not an evangelical Christian. How can we claim such firm biblical footing for this document? Please listen to this. First of all, it's important to note that Thomas Jefferson, please listen to this, is documented Look it up. Thomas Jefferson was not the sole author of the Declaration of Independence. In June of 1776, a committee of five people were tasked by the Continental Congress to write a declaration. John Adams, the devout and deeply biblical Christian, was the chairman of that committee. He tasked Jefferson with the work of writing as he recognized Jefferson's literary talent. But it must be said that the work came out of Adam's committee and under his oversight. It also must be said that while Jefferson was not an evangelical Christian, he was still deeply affected by the biblical imprint of his time. Thus, in reflecting on the Declaration of Independence, he wrote, Jefferson wrote, We do not claim these rights under the charters of kings or legislators, but under the king of kings. Who do you think he's talking about? These dipsticks get you mad. YouTube, all this stuff, trying to argue this point, that point. The idiots can't even argue if it wasn't for us. We gave them the liberty. They can't do that in any other country. Why don't they go over there and try it? They can't even see they're ruining their own freedoms by getting us out of everything. And ACLU, why don't you look them up? See, it was a communist front organization that kept changing their name to make it look good, just like the, the Brotherhood trying to change their name. They got a flag, they got a slogan, it's to kill us. We're the infidels. And nobody should link up with them. Because when you do that, you know what happens? All of our friends say, oh my goodness, it's going to protect us now. And those people look for them and kill every one of them. And who's the cause? Our country. Why? Because people ain't committed here. I hope this starting of this commitment isn't too late. Incidentally, you won't hear too much preaching like this in another five, ten years, so just enjoy it. The truth of the matter is that liberty had been developing as a national idea for many years. Jefferson and Adams, as well as the whole of the Continental Congress, 
did not live or write in a vacuum. Franklin Cole, in a book entitled They Preached Liberty, extensively studied the sermons preached from colonial pulpits during the years leading into the Revolutionary War. His thesis was that all the ideas found in the Declaration were first found in America's pulpits. For example, in 1768, Reverend Daniel Shute of uh, Hingham, Massachusetts declared, life, liberty, and property, property are the gifts of the Creator. Sound familiar? Sure it does. In 1770, in an election sermon, Reverend Charles Turner, Turner insisted, the scriptures cannot be rightfully expounded without explaining them in a manner friendly to the cause of liberty. In 1768, Reverend uh, Richard uh, Slater of Mansfield, Connecticut, assured his listeners, God never gives men up to be slaves till they lose their national virtue and abandon themselves to slavery. Given his careful devotion to God in the writing of the Declaration of Independence, it is not surprising that when it was first read publicly on July 4, 1776, a bell was rung to call the people of Philadelphia together. That bell is the Liberty Bell. And you can still read on the inscription placed on it for that day, proclaim liberty unto all the land, unto all the inhabitants thereof. In case you don't recognize it, it's the Bible verse, Leviticus 25.10. In fact, this might well be called America's verse. Yes, our forefathers knew it and built their lives upon this truth. It was God who gave us liberty, and because liberty came from God, they entitled it the holy cause of liberty. Furthermore, because liberty came from God and was therefore sacred, these signers of the Declaration of Independence were more than willing to die for their convictions. Adams and Jefferson survived the war without great loss. Other signers of the Declaration did not fare so well. Of those 56 men, five were captured by the British. How about that? Tortured and then executed. Twelve had their homes ransacked or burned. Two lost their sons serving in revolutionary army. Another two had sons captured. Nine of the 56 fought and died in the war from wounds or hardships of battle. Indeed, they did pledge their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. Such were the sacrifices of the American Revolution. I'm telling you, they were not wide-eyed rabble-rousers, just rebels running around trying to change things. They were soft-spoken men of means and education. They had security, but they valued liberty more. And they valued liberty because they knew that liberty came from God and was therefore holy. Remember, these 56 men were the ones who added two more clearly scriptural references to God to Jefferson's version of the Declaration. As it came out of Adam's committee, the historical record is clear. They were motivated by their belief in God. God, as he is defined by Scripture. No wonder they were willing to put their lives on the line. After all, during the war, one of the favorite slogans of the Americans was, if you can picture this marching down the street, no king but Jesus. No king but Jesus. And in Albany, New York, in 1831, uh, the French author, Alex, uh, and I always get his name wrong, D. Um, Tocqueville, something like that. Tocqueville, you have to look it up. T-O-C-Q-U-E-V-I-L-L-E, -L -L -E. sorry, I didn't uh, get the pronunciation right. Recorded yet another July 4th celebration. Found in his book, Democracy in America, in which this celebrated author repeatedly noted the unbreakable connection between American democracy and American faith in God. He recorded that on this particular July 4th, he was awakened by the firing of guns in a federal salute and the ringing of all church bells. He came out to see what was going on and was invited to join in a great parade, devoid of any real military splendor, but marked by people from all walks of life, floats representing every conceivable occupation, and three or four old soldiers who fought with Washington, whom the city preserves like precious relics and whom all the citizens honor. They carried with a great pomp a tattered old American flag, bullet torn, which came down from the War of Independence. He expected the parade to end in some fine government building, but was surprised to see it ended instead in a Methodist church, where the entire Declaration of Independence was read with much warmth and dignity. He recalled that the reading was preceded by a prayer made by the minister. He says, I recall this fact, he said, because it is characteristic of this country where they never do anything without assistance 
of religion. How about that? How about this one? My country tis of thee. Remember that? You think about the thoughts of that song for a while. Our Father's God to thee, author of liberty, to thee we sing. Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might, great God our King. Man, think about that. Think about the Moses' scripture. I am the Lord thy God that brought thee out of the land of slavery. <laughs> Proclaim liberty throughout the land to all the inhabitants thereof. Maybe that cloud of witnesses that we always talk about being maybe the prophets and people that went on encouraging us on. Wouldn't that be something if a lot of the forefathers were up there gathered around looking at us? I mean, hey, there's southern gospel songs written with pine pole cabin in glory somewhere. You know, that ain't going to happen. But, I mean, they get excited. Think about the forefathers looking at us right now. Can you hear their voices softly saying, this is what we did all this for, so that you could raise your children in dignity, potential, and joy which freedom affords. They, they'd say, we delight with you, young citizen. Our sacrifices were well worth it. Now, raise him to the light and in introduce him to the author of freedom. And in that introduction, make sure that he knows the sacred story of this nation, as well as its history of Israel. Teach him to think biblically. Yes, make him a student of history. Think about the hope that lieth within you today. This is not just another sermon. I'm telling you what, this could revolutionize your life and your time that you spend wasting it. This could give you some backbone. You can stand up for something. I mean, you ought to be doing that. It's not lost till it's lost. Hasn't all been lost yet. Biblically, I can already see it. The handwriting's on the wall. But God's mercy and grace, I don't know exactly everything that he's doing. You say, why? Because I'm not God. Has he moved in a wicked nation before? Has he sent revival? To yeah, yeah. Do I see it in Scripture? Not, not wholeheartedly. But I see individual revival. I believe there could be a church revival. Maybe even a community revival. What would be wrong with that? Nothing. But it starts with you being revived. Not putting up with error and lies. Setting people straight. Why? Because that's your job. That's your job. Is to proclaim the truth. Do it till they get you. Teach your kids that if you think this life's tough now, listen, honey, let's go back in history and see what they had to put up with. Let's look at Washington's uh, great army of, of, uh, with, with, uh, with their supplies and their clothes and, and all the things that they did and, and uh, uh, get them excited about how, how they had all these advantages against England. And then read them what happened, how men would walk for miles in frostbitten feet left their families, Indians and British and other people come in there and massacre them. They, they need to know that. You say, why? Because they need to know that. As you sit down and eat your food freely, and you know that. Share with them some Fox's Book of Martyrs, the less gory ones with the younger kids. As they get older, show them what happened to Christians. Not religious people. People that are born again saved. I'm using religious loosely. It's a good word. Just in our day and age, people are, are religious and they're not Christians. They claim to be, but they're not, they're not born again. They're not saved. The very person here that preached that message, Presbyterian, his own organization has accepted the sodomites into it. Imagine that. What Bible is that out how could they ever reproduce? No, all they can do is recruit. They have money, they have power, and that's what they want to do is recruit your kids. So, you sucked into that, are you? You've been weakened by that? There's something wrong with you. There's something very wrong with you. What 
What's your rule of faith and practice? The Bible. Who wrote that? God wrote that. Who's in charge of everything? God is. Whose child are you? God's. Why? Because I'm saved. Who saved you? Jesus. Who cleansed you? Jesus. By what mean? His blood. His blood. His blood. Therefore now I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. Start surrendering your will to that side of you. Time's short. Let's all stand. We don't have a piano player right now in junior church, so everybody bow your head, close your eyes, think about what's said today, think about your commitment, think about really what you really believe. Oh, well, everybody knows I'm a Christian. I run my mouth all the time. Well, what else do you do? What else do you do for the Lord? They can actually see you as a Christian. They knock on your door. Wednesday night. You home? No. What do they assume? Sunday night. You at home? Oh, no, 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 no. Well, preacher, my family's more important than church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your family died for you too, right? Who instituted the church? We know we're in his body, spiritually, but who instituted the local church? Christ did. And you wonder why you got problems. Serve man rather than man. Your opportunity ought to be there to serve God. That's where you're at. Where's your heart at today? You read the Bible? You read the Bible in the morning? Pray to God? What's, what's taking its place? Why aren't you doing it? That's your necessary food. Could it be that you're satisfied with your life where it's at right now? Just a Laodicea, lackadaisical life. You go to bed, you get up, you do your little thing, do your little religious thing inside the house. That's it. Nothing outside the house. I mean, goodness, even, even they even have computer programs for paraplegics now, and there's paraplegics that are witnessing for the Lord to their computer because they talk to it, and the computer calls people. They even go through the post office and and they, and they get names and addresses and they, they try to mail things to people. They go through the phone book and they call people up, ask them if they're saved. I mean, there's always something we can do if we're committed to the Lord. But if you're committed to yourself, then you're selfish. And you're not going to witness for nobody. Listen, we can talk and talk all we want, but we'll be found out one day. We really will. When you go before Lord Jesus Christ, and you're going to live for Him forever and ever and ever, in the small little vapor of a life that we have, you disgraced Him, you dishonored Him, you were lazy for Him, you were slothful, you didn't, you didn't avail yourself to the power of the Spirit, nor the Scripture, my, 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 judgment seat of Christ, that will happen. Paul says the terror of the Lord. He didn't say the sweet, loving Jesus when it came to the judgment seat of Christ. He said, the terror of the Lord, I persuade men. He was worried about that judgment day. Not going to hell, but facing a Savior that suffered and died for him. Did everything in the world for him. And he did nothing in return. It scared him to death not to do that. And that motivated Paul. Ought to motivate us. You can pass out a track. You can put it in the bathroom. You can put it between books. There's something you can do. It's you forcing yourself to do something. Because yourself won't do it on its own. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your mercy, your grace. Thank you for, my goodness, for taking care of all of us that's under this, this preacher's voice right now. Father, we're here. We're, we're still living. We're pumping uh, blood. We're, we're sucking your air. Father, dear God, you've been so gracious and merciful. But we don't want to presume upon that. We don't want to think that uh, this, there's not a serious aspect of this Christianity. Pray to God that you'd help us to see that. And God, as we see our country going down, that we'd hit our knees. And spiritual warfare, dear God, really sincerely pray for this country and our grandkids and children and great-grandkids, Father, that are being brainwashed.